Hello everyone. This week on We Talk Nerdy, I've got the tech news of the week, an email about my Raspberry Pi circuit, and I'm going to show you how to change the battery on an iPhone. So stay tuned. We Talk Nerdy. We Talk Nerdy.tv is sponsored by UBU Enterprises, specializing in custom business website design, social media marketing, and online branding strategies for companies and products. Before I get started, I'd like to thank all my new subscribers for tuning in. I published an introduction to the Raspberry Pi last week, and a whole bunch of you started watching, so welcome! Unfortunately, you've tuned in just as I'm going to put the show on hiatus. My housing situation is changing, and I've got to move my studio and belongings, so I'll probably not have time for a new show for the next two weeks or so. I'll try to get everything sorted out as quickly as I can, but I'll keep you updated on my progress on the website. So in other news, there was an interesting story last week about Gearbox getting sued over their games Aliens Colonial Marines. It was a game that I personally have been looking forward to. It was one of those rare multiplayer co-op games that I could play online with my friends. The demos that Gearbox showed prior to releasing the game certainly looked impressive, and the game received a lot of buzz from fans and critics who were interested in seeing how it came out. Unfortunately, as all too often happens the, in the gaming business, once critics and fans could actually play the game, it turns out Colon Aliens Colonial Marines was kind of a stinker. Kevin Van Ord, senior editor at GameSpot, uh, had this to say. The Alien franchise deserves better than this. Aliens Colonial Marines is a disappointing exercise in bland corridor shooting. Dragging, dragged down by laughable dialogue and cooperative play that makes the game worse when you adventure, than when you adventure on your own. Colonial Marines is unremarkable in every conceivable way. It's far too easy, generally devoid of tension, and lacking in the variety it so desperately needed. Now, by any measure, that's a pretty terrible review. Bad games are nothing new, happens all the time, but what makes this situation different uh, is that some of the fans that pre-ordered Aliens Colonial Marines did so partly based on the hype and partly based on the very nice demo they had seen at the gaming conference E3. The problem is that the demos Gearbox showed prior to the game's release actually looked better than the game when it shipped, leaving many fans feeling like they had been duped. On my website, there's a link to a video entitled what the hell happened to Aliens Colonial Marines, which highlights the differences between the pre-release demo and the actual game that shipped. Unfortunately, I can't show it to you here. Uh, you'll have to go to the website or YouTube to see it. What's unique about this is that a lawsuit has now been filed on behalf of one Damien Perrine based on the notion that the game was falsely advertised to the public who were misled about the quality they could expect from the game. Personally, I don't pre-order games, but I think it'd be pretty upset if I felt like I'd been fallen victim to a bait-and-switch tactic. It would be interesting to see what the courts find uh, in whether or not this constitutes false advertising. Also last week, AT&T dropped the price of the, HTE for, uh, the HTC First, aka the Facebook phone from $99 to $0.99. Cents. at and hasn't really said why, but this could be a move by Facebook to try to get the phone into more people's hands. Facebook Home has been receiving rather mixed reviews. More than 50% of the reviewers on the Google Play Store have given the app the lowest possible rating of one star. Many professional reviewers have given the app high marks for good design, but low marks for utility. In the end, I suspect that Facebook Home and Facebook Phone will appeal to a pretty small crowd. The problem is kind of a philosophical one. I think that most of us would still prefer to think of our phones as our little digital companions that can make calls, help us navigate, take pictures, and so on. Not just as a Facebook interface with a phone hidden underneath. One thing's for sure. I'm Facebook is going to keep trying. They've made it pretty clear that Facebook wants to be everywhere and in everything, so I'm sure this isn't the last Facebook phone we're going to see. 
Adobe announced that the next versions of Creative Suite, which includes Photoshop, After Effects, and Premiere, the software that I use to create this show, will be available exclusively on a subscription basis. You're no longer going to be able to buy a boxed set of the Adobe Creative Suite. Since I have made my living in part from the use of this software, I can't feel a little I can't help but feel a little bit nervous about this particular move. There are reports that regular users like myself might actually save money on the new subscription only model, but I can't help but feel like Adobe does not particularly have my best interests at heart. I guess I'll have to see how this works out, but you can bet the folks like me who rely on this software will be keeping a close eye on the situation. Finally, there was some good news last week. There are new zombies coming to eat your brain, and that's a good thing. PopCap has announced that a new version of their very popular Plants vs. Zombie game will be available this coming July, and I can't wait. So dust off your old pea shooter and get ready for Plants vs. Zombies 2. This week, I've got an email from Bob D, who writes, I watched your episode on the Raspberry Pi last week. In your circuit, you used a resistor to lower the voltage. How did you know what resistor to use? Hi, Bob. Thanks for your email. I'm glad you wrote in about this because it's something I kind of glossed over last week. And I think now is a good time to go into a little bit more detail. In case you missed that show, Bob is referring to a segment I did on episode 8 in which I explained how to turn an LED on and off using the GPIO pins of the Raspberry Pi. Now, one of the questions you commonly get when you're dealing with LEDs is what is the value of the resistor you should use to accompany the LED? So what I'm going to show you here is a simple diagram of the circuit. On the right hand side, you can see that we're getting 3.3 volts of power from pin 11 on the Raspberry Pi. In this diagram, the current is flowing from right to left. Power flows into a resistor and then the LED. The problem here is that the 3.3 volts uh, is too much for the LED. How do we know what size resistor to use to power this LED? We'll talk about the resistor in a minute, but step one is to actually learn about the properties of the LED. As it happens, I purchased this LED from a company called superbrightleds.com. In fact, I kind of have a thing for LEDs and I really like playing with them and I've done a number of different uh, projects that featured LEDs and superbrightleds.com is really great. They have everything from single electronic components all the way up to complete lighting solutions for your home or your car. Now, they're not paying me to say that, I'm just a happy customer. Anyway, if we take a look at the technical data for this particular LED, uh, we can see that the LED is rated for 2.3 volts and that the continuous forward current, in other words, the amperage, is 5 milliamps. Using that information, we can calculate the approximate value of our resistor using Ohm's law. Now, I'm going to get a little sciency here, but it's not too hard, uh, so just bear with me. Ohm's law states that for many conductors of electricity, the current, the electric current which flows through them is directly proportional to the voltage applied to them. Now, I know that sounds kind of complicated, but the thing to remember here is that Ohm's law is about proportion. Now, when I was taking high school physics, we were taught that the equation looks like this. V equals IR, or I equals V over R, or V equals R equals V over I. Ah! It's just too many formulas. V is voltage, I is current, and R is resistance, measured in ohms, and I, being the current, is measured in amperage. Since high school, <laughs> I've discovered that there's a much easier way of visualizing this formula. Uh, take a look at this much cleaner diagram. Now, remember what I said about proportionality. If we know two of the values in this equation, we can actually calculate the third using this simple diagram. Cover up the one you don't know and either multiply or divide to derive the value you're looking for. For our circuit, we know that the Raspberry Pi puts out 3.3 volts, and from the LED data sheet, we know that our LED needs about 2.3 volts 
uh, in order to operate properly, and that it draws five milliamps of current. So let's put those values into our diagram, and our formula becomes 3.3 volts that the pi outputs minus the 2.3 volts that our LED needs divided by 0.05 because 50 milliamps is 0.05 amps. Our result is 20 ohms. So on paper, we need a 20 ohm resistor to drop the voltage in our current by one volt. In reality, you're not gonna find a 20 ohm resistor. They don't make them, but you can get a 22 ohm resistor. Furthermore, you should be aware that there's a pretty big fudge factor in both the design of the LED and the resistor. Resistors come with color bands that indicate their tolerance. The inexpensive uh, resistors that I'm using in these circuits, they have a tolerance of plus or minus 10%. And as a practical example, I have a simple test circuit set up with four different resistors. I have, in this case, a 3.1 volt power supply uh, and a 47 ohm, 100 ohm, 470 ohm, and one kilo ohm resistor. Now, as you can see, the circuit works in varying degrees with all four resistors, although the one kilo ohm uh, version just barely glows at all, but it does work. LEDs will function with a wide range of voltage and current. Uh, you don't want to put in too much, but it's always safer to put in just a little bit less, but you will get a slightly less bright result. As I mentioned, I enjoy tinkering with LEDs, and if you do too, you should check out ledcalc.com. This website can help you figure out what resistors you need for your LED circuits. It does all the math for you, and it even draws a picture of the circuit. There are also good resources available on instructables.com, including lots of LED projects that you can do yourself. And some of them are actually very elaborate. And finally, since we're talking about the Raspberry Pi, I'd like to give a shout out to Peter at raspbyhub.com. Raspberry Hub is an aggregator of all the hottest Raspberry Pi news and blog posts from across the internet. Peter was kind enough to include We Talk Nerdy in his listings, and I'm very grateful. Whether you're new to the Raspberry Pi or if you're a hardcore pie head, you will definitely find raspbyhub.com a useful resource. Well, thanks, Bob, for your email. I hope that kind of cleared things up for you. Uh, remember, folks, if you have a question, comment, or you just want to talk nerdy, you can visit wetalknerdy.tv and leave a comment, or you can always email me at wetalknerdy.tv at gmail.com. Now, I'd like to talk to you briefly about our sponsor, UBU Enterprises. Do you need a website for your small business? Maybe you need help managing your business's social, net, social networks and social media. UBU Enterprises can help you. They've helped me quite a bit. They took my ideas and added their own flair for design and execution, and they helped me get my website exactly where I wanted it to be. I couldn't have done it without them. And the best part is they're still helping me uh, make sure that my website runs smoothly. Visit them at ubuenterprises.com. In this week's how-to segment, I'd like to show you how to change the battery on an iPhone. Now, I have here my old iPhone 3G. Chances are you have a newer iPhone than this, but the process is more or less the same. My goal here is to show you the procedure on my phone and hopefully give you the confidence to try this on your own. It might seem a little bit scary at first, but if you use a guide uh, and follow the directions step by step and you're cautious and careful, you can change the battery without too much difficulty. Having said that, you should find a guide for your specific phone model before you attempt to change the battery. RapidRepair.com and iFixit.com are both great resources for this kind of thing. To start with, you need to buy a replacement battery, obviously. I purchased a replacement battery um, plus a tool set on Amazon for $12.99. The package includes three screwdrivers, only one of which I needed, and two plastic tools. I would also recommend an X-Acto knife or a suction cup for removing the screen, a paper clip, and some tweezers. You should also have a place to put the screws, 
a magnet to stick them on is a good solution, or you could also just put them in a small bowl or container. They're very tiny and easy to lose, so make sure that you put them someplace safe. Before you begin, you should back up whatever data you can. If you normally sync your iPhone to your desktop using iTunes, do that first, and then power the device all the way off. You start by removing the SIM card with a straightened paper clip. The SIM card holder is at the top of the device. Next, remove the true screws located at the bottom of the device. There is one on either side of the plug port. Using a strong suction cup, you can now separate the two halves of the phone. And if you don't have a suction cup handy, you can slide an X-Acto knife between the chrome ring and the front glass directly above one of the screw holes. You'll need to exert a small amount of pressure to separate the display from the back panel. Lift the panel up from the dock end, being carefully not to tear or break any of the ribbons connected near the other end. Simply unplug ribbons one and two by gently lifting them from the main board with your plastic tool. Underneath ribbon two, you will need to find and unclip ribbon three and then carefully remove the display and set it aside. Remove the eight screws as indicated in this image. One of the screws is located underneath a sticker that says, do not remove. Obviously, you can just peel away the little sticker and take that apart. Um, the screw in the upper right-hand corner attaches the camera to the housing uh, with a small clip. Be sure not to lose the little clip. Um, make sure you keep that in a safe place. Next, unplug cable four, and then you can gently lift the main board out. The camera will still be attached to the main board with a small ribbon cable. Um, be careful that you don't uh, pull it free, but if it does come loose, um, it's not that much of a problem. It, it has a little plug connector that you can just plug it back in. Now go ahead and set the main board aside. And now you'll notice that the battery is held in place with a small amount of adhesive. I recommend that you pry it up gently with your little plastic tool, uh, and then you can pull on the plastic tab to remove it. My replacement battery had some double-sided tape on it. Uh, bef so before you uh, attach it to your phone, uh, simply remove the adhesive backing and put the battery back into place. Now, we just have to put it back together. If the camera has detached from the main board, uh, you can just reattach the cable by pressing it onto the connector. You should hear a small click as the connector snaps into place. Fit the main board back into place and put back all the screws then reattach the cables. Cable three is a small ribbon cable that slides into a connector on the main board. Here, tweezers can make it easy to put it back where it belongs. All the other cables are just press fit connections. Again, you should hear a small click as it snaps into place. Gentle pressure is all that's required. Once you have reassembled your iPhone, plug it in, charge it up, uh, and then test it to make sure that, that everything is working properly. In particular, you should test the camera to make sure that that's connected right as well. I suggest that once you've charged the battery fully, you drain it back to zero and then give it another charge for at least 12 hours. I know that changing, opening these things up and, and working with them can be a little bit scary, but it's really not that difficult. All you need to do is just go slowly, follow a guide, and you should be just fine. If you have any questions or problems, send me an email. Well, that's it for this week. I hope you've enjoyed the show. In case you missed it, We Talk Nerdy will be on hiatus for about two weeks as my housing situation is changing. I do plan to keep up the blog, and I'll keep you up to date uh, as to when new episodes will appear. And remember, if you have questions or problems and you need answers, visit us at wetalknerdy.tv and leave a comment, or send us an email at wetalknerdy.tv at gmail.com. Thanks again for watching. Oh, and happy Mother's Day. Hi, Mom. I'll see you again real soon. This is so nice, sir.